Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. Looks like my audio's going out, the recording's going on. Make sure that's actually recording. Looks like it's recording. Yep, it's recording. Okay, sweet. So welcome to Office Hours, the show where you post your Microsoft SQL Server questions or Azure SQL DB questions. And then I go in and answer the highest voted ones today. Happens to be Valentine's Day. Oh. It's a love affair between you and me and your questions, mostly you and your questions. Uh, Jim Van Allen says, good morning, Brent. Howdy, Jim. Uh, Jim, I should ask you what kind of job you have that you're able to always hop in on the streams. Um, I know that I there are a couple of streams that I subscribe to on Twitch uh, that I really love watching. And the, sub, sub, the guy always goes live in like the middle of the night. And then I wake up in the morning and I've got all these notifications. He says, oh, retired pilot and programmer. Oh, yeah. OK, OK. See, that makes more sense. It, it makes sense because, too, when I'm retired, I'm sure. I'm going to be doing a whole lot of sitting around and watching Twitch streams as well. So let's go in and take a look at your highest voted questions. So the highest voted question comes from Reluctantly Tolerant. Reluctantly Tolerant says, I used failover clusters instead of AGs when I have over 500 databases due to the worker thread limits with AGs. Why would I ever use AGs again? He says, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You've found the right answer. Failover clustered instances are generally a better answer than availability groups when you start to have hundreds of databases on the same server. You just have to make sure to, to communicate with the business what it's like to do disaster recovery, whether or not you're going to have readable secondaries, because you're not going to have live real-time readable secondaries, because with always-on availability groups, you can. Failover clustered instances, you don't. The technology you're describing there for DR, NetApp Snapshots, will let you take snapshots every now and then, like every 15 minutes if you want, or every five minutes. But at the time that you switch those snaps in, users are going to be kicked out of the database, or else you're going to have to wait to get uh, everybody out before you can go switch the snaps around. Snaps aren't a real-time reporting technology. When you need real-time reporting technology, that's when you might want to be more interested in availability groups. Next up, Simon asks, I know we shouldn't use the no lock hint. Great. And we're done here, Simon. You don't have to ask anything else, right, Simon? We're done here. But Simon continues, because Simon's a little bit of a stubborn. It says, can no lock queries even cause index corruptions on queries that are not modifying data? Simon, here's the thing. Let me say for a second that I told you not to run with scissors. And you said, yes, but when I do run with scissors, will X happen? Simon, how the hell am I supposed to know and why would I care? If you choose to do something that I have repeatedly told you not to do, and you've heard that you're not supposed to do it, well, then what do you care what the consequences are? You already know you're ignoring my recommendations. So it doesn't matter what I say, you're going to do it anyway. Have a great time doing it, Simon. I'll be over here doing something else. Uh, next up, we have Logar the Barbarian. Oh, and I see uh, uh, Live Coding asks, make sure you pay attention to the URL up on the screen there uh, to where you ask questions. Uh, but so Logar the Barbarian asks, Hi Brent, what questions come to mind if you come across SQL Server instances that modified Ola Hollingren's CheckDB job to run different uh, parts of CheckDB rather than CheckDB in, in their entirety? If the scripts were written correctly, and they had no bugs, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But you know what? Every single time I've run across someone who tried to get fancy with DBCC CheckDB, every single time, it's not like some of the times, it's not like every now and then, it's every single time somebody decided to get fancy with CheckDB, their scripts had bugs, and we found problems. And they thought that they were safe when they really were not. The place to get fancy isn't CheckDB. The place to get fancy is in things like stored procedures. 
But when you're trying to make sure that your data is actually safe, quit trying to be fancy. Do it the right way. Uh, next up, we have Drew. Drew says, when should a unique constraint be used instead of a unique index? You know, that's a really good question. I have never come across a time where I needed a unique constraint that wasn't also requiring an index. Because if you just define something as a unique constraint, when you go to do an insert, update, or delete, SQL Server actually has to go check the unique constraint. And if you don't have an index to support it, you're going to have a bad time because you end up going to do table scans or co cobbling several indexes together. I'm not saying that a unique constraint never makes sense because I bet that amongst all of the smart people out there in the audience, I bet somebody's run across a situation where unique constraints make sense. And I would love to hear about it in chat or down in the comments. Um, Jim Van Allen said, ads, yes, believe it or not, someone has to pay for these nice fancy clothes that I wear. And that person is you. You can make the ads go away if you subscribe to my Twitch channel. If you hit subscribe and you get one subscription for free with Amazon Prime too as well. Uh, if you hit subscribe, you never see another ad again, which is kind of cool, at least on my channel. <laughs> Oh, Sigrider asks, what were your favorite things about living in San Diego and Las Vegas? Favorite thing about San Diego was the year round weather was spectacular. It was so beautiful. So you could walk everywhere. I could have convertibles and use them year round. The weather's just fantastic. It's one of the most beautiful weather cities uh, in the world. Consistently fantastic. Great little microclimate there. Um, and decent, but not amazing restaurant scene. Pretty decent, like Little Italy's nice. The gas lamp district's kind of fun. Favorite thing about Las Vegas is that as soon as you get outside of the Strip, it feels like a much smaller city. Uh, there are all kinds of suburbs, like I live out in a suburb with all kinds of uh, uh, nice quiet streets and established uh, trees and things like that. Um, but if you want to go party, there's an unlimited number of amazing restaurants, bars, uh, music festivals, bands, shows, magic, all kinds of stuff. Like if you're bored in Las Vegas, it's your fault. Uh, because all the tourists that come through here all the time kind of subsidize all that. So never in a, a dull moment in Las Vegas. There's always so much amazing stuff to do. Weather's not as good as San Diego. San Diego had better weather, but Las Vegas has more stuff to do and lower taxes too as well. Uh, uh, let's see here. CTI Geek says, don't the tourists bother you? Not at all. I've actually always lived in cities that had a really high tourist population. Or I've, I've loved those cities. I lived in South Beach for a while, downtown Chicago. I love being in places where there are a lot, San Diego for that matter, um, where there are lots of visitors in because it, it always kind of feels fresh and new. If you go to a place that's so nice that people want to come visit, generally that means the place is pretty nice. Ah, oh, Jim Van Allen did the Prime thing. Welcome to uh, the subscription. I know it's kind of a pain for you, too. Um, uh, Igor says, hello from Brazil. Howdy, Igor. Welcome to the chat. Next up, we have uh, Sigurdur says, what is your favorite standing desk and why? I wouldn't want to give like comparison reviews like I've uh, you know come to a conclusion across looking at all kinds of them. The thing that you want to know when you're looking at standing desks is how sturdy is it. There are all kinds of standing desks out there that are flimsy as all heck. So when you're typing, the monitor shakes. And if you have a camera on your, uh, like a webcam or whatever for calls, it's shaking too. That's distracting as hell. So I try to get the, the, the uh, most solid uh, standing desk that I possibly can. Uh, let's see here. Peter asked a question uh, just now live in chat, so we'll hit that one. Peter says, vague question. We found that 80% of our data is used by indexes. Is this normal-ish? So it all depends on what your read versus write ratio is, how important the speed of selects is versus the speed of indexes. To learn more about that, attend my Fundamentals of Index Tuning class. Fundamentals of Index Tuning. If you go to brentozar.com, click Training up at the top, I tell you how to tell if your uh, database has too many indexes, not enough, and then what steps you should do about that. 
Next up, we have Peter who says, uh, what are your thoughts on upgrading for Reporting Services 2014? I don't touch Reporting Services at all. Here's the thing. When Microsoft wants to charge a lot of money for something, they put it in the SQL Server box and they call it free. Free with SQL Server, we give you reporting services, integration services, analysis services, and so much more. Just buy this one box and you get all kinds of cool stuff. And that makes sense when the thing that you really need is the engine and you only need a little of the other stuff. But when you start to rely on that other stuff so much that you start to dedicate people to it uh, and you run it on separate servers, well, then it becomes like buying cereal boxes just to get the toy inside. Oh, I really need that toy bad. I'm going to go buy a few more boxes of cereal. So if you start looking at that thing as instead of being a free toy, look at it as I'm spending $2,000 a core for this, then that starts to reset your expectations about, oh, wait, is this actually a good tool for that much money? And what you find out when you have, say, reporting services 2014 or 2019 is that other services make a lot more sense, that reporting services isn't really getting any love for Microsoft, hasn't had any improvements in the last decade, any significant improvements, and you should probably be somewhere else. So like you said, you're planning on moving to Azure. It's probably time to start looking at things like Power BI. Power BI has a crazy improvement rate. They're making all kinds of changes in that one uh, really quickly. Um, for uh, Peachy Joe, um, hit the URL right below me, and that'll tell you where you can ask questions there, and you can post them, and other people can upvote them. I should stop for a second. I should stop for a second and give a shout out to this week's sponsor. This week's sponsor is Quest Software, and Quest has a report there on how the DBA role is evolving when we talk about transitioning to Azure, for example. This is one of those checkpoints where a whole lot of people are starting to ask questions about what skills should I learn next? What's the most important thing for my resume? What does my company need from the, me? You can learn from a report that I helped co-author with Quest over at brentozar.com slash go slash evolve. Yes, you do have to give your email address. That's the price for the report. But I think it's a pretty good report and gives you a rough idea about how careers are changing. So thank you to Quest for sponsoring this week's webcast. Now, let's go back over to uh, uh, chat. Oh, SQL Sucks says hi. Hey, good to see you, SQL Sucks. So next up on the questions, highest voted questions, is uh, Maxim asks, what do you use for motivation to read tech docs and tech books when I need to get something done? When I need to get something done, I read the documentation on how to do it. And I know that's kind of an alien concept for people because most people are like, Leroy Jenkins, and they just go into the keyboard and they start just randomly bashing keys and hoping something will work. I like reading the documentation, but only when I need to get something done. If I don't need to get something done, I don't proactively read books and documentation because... There's just so much of it, and I can't learn everything that the product does. I tend to focus on what I need to do. Instead, if I find myself going, I really need motivation in order to read it, it's probably because I, I don't need to use that feature. In that case, I just don't read the material. Uh, next up, uh, <laughs> uh, Surly Dev says, uh, sound, Evolve sounds more like a burn than an information resource. I know, right? I, and I picked that URL, so I kind of had fun with that. Um, party person says, hey, Brent, what's the story with the sign behind you that says uh, California deserves whatever it gets? That was a gift from a friend of mine who both of us lived in California at the time and we loved and still love California. Uh, but it's a line from a book, uh, White Noise by Don DeLillo. Uh, it's an award winning book. I have to confess I haven't actually read the book. Uh, but it was a limited edition piece from uh, Dom that came if you bought a certain version of the book. And I love that sign. Uh, to me, what it means is California is so good. California is such an amazing place to live. And I still feel that way, even though I don't live there. Uh, California is such an amazing place to live that if anything goes wrong, floods, 
fires, earthquakes, whatever, dust storms, California probably deserves that because things are so good there that in every life a little rain must fall, I suppose the saying goes. Probably got that saying wrong. I still absolutely love it, but the taxes are unbelievable. The cost of living is crazy. Next up, TJ says, uh, let's see here. What does TJ say? A lot of our reports are computationally expensive, and they run repeatedly for each subscription. I assume that the solution to this is to pre-build the data warehouse as much as possible, but I suspect that I reinventing the wheel. My budget is zero. No, you're right. If you repeatedly query for the same data, there are a few ways to make that faster. One is to tune your query. Two is to throw more horsepower into the server. Or three is to pre-bake the results, doing things like a data warehouse or a reporting tool to pre-bake that data so that it's already ready to go when users run the query. Since you said that your budget is zero, tuning is probably the first way that makes more sense because you're not going to be able to throw hardware at it. And then third will be to start to build reporting tables, like a denormalized reporting table so that users can get their data out faster. Now, I know you said your budget is zero, but your boss says that your time is worthless. So that's why I suggested those two uh, options there. Oh, default blame acceptor. Welcome to the chat. Says hello from San Diego. I love San Diego. It's absolutely magical. I uh, lived in Gaslamp for years. Next up, uh, Alex says, oh, DBA Duck is here too, Ben Miller. Uh, Alex says, hi, Guru. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say the name Guru with a straight face. Always makes me think of somebody who's uh, meditating. I have some small tables on Azure SQL DB with very little use. Once in a while, a scheduler runs a stored proc that performs one insert to a table in two concurrent threads. I have a gap in an identity column. Man, it sounds like one of those problems where, like, a train leaves Philadelphia at the same time that a waiter in Las Vegas puts a plate of soup together. What on earth are you trying to do here? It says, I added tab lock X as suggested by Docs, but the problem still, still arises. What's the problem? You've thrown so much on here, I don't even understand what the problem is. I think maybe you're saying, I never want a gap in an identity column. That doesn't work. You can have gaps. There's a trace flag that you can use that you can turn on that will reduce the likelihood that you will have gaps, but you will have gaps. You can't guarantee that every single identity column is going to be used. I'll give you a great example, or every, every single identity value. I'll give you a great example is you have an insert that gets blocked, and ends up doing a rollback. There's going to be a gap there which, with whichever number he was trying to take as other inserts have piled up behind him. That is totally normal. I, if you need something that guarantees every single row is taken or every single value is taken, identity columns are not the solution for you. Next up, depth charge. <laughs> depth charge says, have you, Brent, have you ever encountered a scenario where you index to remove an eager index spool and SQL Server ignores the index and continues spooling? Let me rephrase that. Have I ever added an index that I thought SQL Server would use and they didn't, and the query optimizer didn't end up using it? Yeah, sure. I don't want to say it happens all the time, but it happens from time to time. Aside from index hints, what other clubs can I hit the optimizer with? Attend my two classes, Mastering Query Tuning and Mastering Parameter Sniffing. In there, I give you the weapons in order to solve this problem, Mastering Query Tuning and Mastering Parameter Sniffing. If there was a simple 10-second answer I could give you, I absolutely would. But you're facing big problems here, or I don't want to say big problems because it's not like it's you know killing you at your job. You're facing challenging problems. That's the sign where it's time for you to step up and attend a training class because you're hitting the tough stuff. SQL sucks as sales, Brent. Next up, Topoke says, in a recent office hours, you spoke of encrypting data on the app side rather than the data side. How does this work from a sorting perspective? For example, sorting a user interface table by last name, first name, etc. So what you, if you had to consider last name as personally identifiable, like secure, needed to be kept secret, well, you wouldn't want to show it on the UI, right? Like, you wouldn't want to show people things that they don't need to see. I'm going to give you an example of something that you definitely would want to be encrypting on the app side, 
credit card number. If you were going to list a bunch of credit card numbers, you would never need to sort them. You don't need to list all the credit card numbers and sort them all out. They shouldn't ever be shown on screen. They shouldn't be available unless you desperately need that credit card number. In most cases, you don't. You shouldn't even have that number. Last name isn't usually considered quite that private. Now, for some places it is, like if you're doing daycare or you're doing healthcare type stuff. But even then, you wouldn't want to show every patient in there organized by last name. You probably want to have some kind of privacy. But if you do need to show everyone by last name, then you got to get everyone back, go get them all back, and do the sorting on the application tier. Order by should, in most cases, be done by the application anyway. Uh, next up, QNT says, Hi Brent, are you aware of MCR, maximum consumption rate? Yes, absolutely I am. Do you think this is a reliable method for CPU sizing? No, I do not. They can't all be long answers. No, it doesn't make any sense for me because if somebody asks me, hey, how big of a SQL server do I need? The first thing that I go do is I go look at the workload on their existing SQL server. I look at that workload and I go, what's your top bottleneck? And if the top bottleneck is CPU, then we look at how many CPUs they have. We look at whether or not we should tune those queries in order to reduce CPU load. And then we start asking questions like, well, how many, how much larger do you think you're going to grow in the next few years? Uh, are users happy with CPU capacity now or, or query performance now? But I, I don't measure MCR anymore. I did a presentation at TechEd like 15 years ago explaining what it meant, just really for the purposes of saying you need a SQL Server with I.O. that's at least this fast if you're going to saturate the CPUs. Uh, Ren asks, hi Brent, building some reports for our SQL Server and I found one of your old replies on Stack about finding CPU time for databases. Now to, to kind of summarize that up, you can't find CPU by database because of that nasty problem cross database queries. So Ren says, do you think it's a worthwhile stat to determine to use what should we move to cloud first? Have there been any improvements to 2008? No. The thing that I use to determine whether or not we should move it to cloud first is, is this a self-contained application in a self-contained database with no cross-database queries? If it has vendor apps are really uh, common for this. Like some vendor will say, here you go, here's a database, and nothing else should be querying this, and here it's all by itself, just this one database. Great. Put that in Azure SQL DB. Reason is Azure SQL DB doesn't do it, and I'm just talking about plain Azure SQL DB, not hyperscale or managed instances or elastic pools or any of those other things. Plain old Azure SQL DB doesn't do a great job of cross database queries, but it's great for those standalone applications that just need to work. You probably don't have a whole lot of other applications that touch the database. It's just this one little utility database that you throw up there. That's nice and easy, and it just takes work off your plate. I like it a lot for that. Uh, Tim asks, hi Brent, I like the fundamentals of PowerShell. Will there be a mastering PowerShell? That's a really good question. He says, will you be working with Drew more in the future? So Drew went to work for Microsoft. Drew used to uh, teach, uh, teach the fundamentals of PowerShell course for me, actually. We did it live uh, several years ago. And when he went to work for Microsoft, that makes it much harder to teach training classes and make money from them. So I said, hey, if you're not using that material anymore, I'll buy it off of you. If you just want to record it once, I'll pay you for it. Then we can you know, include it as part of our bundles. Um, it's hard to get someone to write additional material when they work for Microsoft, because if you've ever met people who work at Microsoft, the term that you would rarely use to describe them is bored. You would rarely describe them as having lots of spare time. <laughs> uh, they tend to be fairly overworked uh, and like, oh my God, I'm trying to keep up with this fire hose. Um, so I love Drew to death. He's fantastic. The course is really good. I worked through it myself too as well because I'm adding in the notes on how to make it work on Mac. Um, but I don't know if we'll do a mastering PowerShell or not. And I don't pre-announce courses, but if we did do a mastering PowerShell course, it would involve DBA tools, the DBA tools framework. I, I don't see it on the near-term horizon, though. 
Uh, next up, Stone Temple Pilot says, how do you measure bad page splits for inserts on a poor clustered index? Search for that exact term that you just used, plus Jonathan Kahias, K-E-H-A-Y, I-A-S. And Jonathan has a post on SQLSkills.com about how you do that with extended events. Next up, we have, uh, let's see here, Paco says, Hi Brent, I have a friend who's facing a server that has thread pool weights and non-yielding schedulers. They cause the AG to fail. Have you seen thread pool weights cause non-yielding schedulers or vice versa? Yes. As we get towards the end of a webcast, you see how that has a little number one next to it? That means that nobody upvoted it. Nobody found it was a good question. I don't think it's a good question either. Because it's just a yes or no question, and the answer is yes, and we're kind of done there. What are you supposed to do about it? You go call Microsoft, and then you go from there. Um, Surly Deb puts a link in in chat. Yes, absolutely. That is totally the one. Um, so the fact that we're down to the one vote ones should uh, probably tell me that it is time to wrap up. So thanks, everybody, for hanging out with me. I will throw in one more shout out to our friends at Quest Software, the sponsors of this week's webcast. If you go over to brentozar.com slash go slash evolve, they have a white paper there that talks about how the DBA roles are changing in the coming years. Thanks for hanging out with me today, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.